Hello everybody. My name is Eric D. Johnson. I was on the first time I live right here in the city of Minnesota, County State of State of Tennessee. And the day date is early Saturday morning, uh, November the 3rd, 2019, the time 5.46 a.m. First, I thank all my family support for your continued current support. This is part two of the same video. And like I say, it'll be dated November the 3rd, 2019. I just ended part one, so this is part two. And uh, what I'm doing right now, we're going over the history of Chicago. We're going over the history of the city of Chicago, Illinois. And we was uh, going over uh, the Black Peastone Rangers. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to uh, say this. And we're going, and we're going at uh, ChicagoGangHistory.com. And there was also another website, I think it's been closed right now, uh, Chicago uh, Gang, ChicagoGangHistory.org. And I used to go there all the time, I used to go to that website all the time. But for some reason, it, it, it's uh, not operating right now. Uh, most likely, it'll probably come back. May, may not, but uh, uh, as of, like I said, for right now, uh, as of now, ChicagoGang.org. Uh, it's not operating. But what I'm reading from is Chicago GangHistory.com, the Black Peace Stone Rangers. There's a lot of information. And uh, what I'm gonna do? I'm, uh, I've been reading the very early history. You know, the very early history. And uh, what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna skim through because what I'm, I'm gonna do is go to my Instagram. And so I'm gonna do that now. you in your spare time you can go to chicagogangishtory.com and read the whole article like I do but um, what I'm going to do start doing now I'm going to skim through and get all the way to the end okay so where we at right now we just got through with uh, with Eugene Harrison being, there, being locked up and so uh, let's move down here Past the, uh, you know, the Senate hearings and all that. Uh, I'm gonna move down. Now it says here, the peace between stones and disciples was shattered on May 8, 1968, when Ellis Revelstone attempted to assassinate disciple leader David Barksdale after fell falling into a trap. The Ellis Revelstones were the only stone section in the western part of the Woodlawn neighborhood between 65th and 67th, and Ellis and the disciples had always wanted them out. Chicago police came to talk to David Barstow and Barstow mentioned that these stones like to shoot disciples any time disciples got near their territory and Barstow wanted to prove his point to these detectives. Barstow asked the officer to follow him down to 65th, to 65th and Ellis and once David and his known car made an appearance, Andrew McChristian, Melvin Bailey and Elvin Dinkins opened fire on Barsdale car and detectives swarmed in right away to arrest the three shooters. It's 1968 when the year of big war between the Simon and Stones and the Clan Darrow Project Stone were fighting to make the 727 East 
38th Street Building all there as it became filled up with disciples hanging out near the building one September night. A disciple was shooting dice near the building. Stones planned the Spengali massacre. That night, stones tucked shotguns and handguns and long coats. The stones then got into the power source for the 727 building that cut the power, creating a spooky atmosphere. As the darkness befell the project building, a blaze of gunfire suddenly sparked through the darkness and bodies hit the ground. Stones chewed their way through a massive crowd of disciples, gunning down 17 young men, all shot in the darkness. Housing authority guards became alert and shot it out with the stones for a while. It was miraculous not a single person died, which is why this shooting only had one newspaper appearance in the Chicago Tribune on September 10, 1968. Right, let, me, let me scroll down. Okay, let me scroll down. Let me get to the. Uh, let me. Uh, now let me read this part here. Despite the investigation on the stones and Jeff Fort and Jeff Fort walking out on the center here in July of nineteen sixty eight, major shot came to law enforcement and an Illinois politician sent an invitation to Jeff Fort to appear at the January nineteen sixty nine presidential inauguration ball. Jeff Fort declined the invitation and instead sent Henry Mickey Caldwell the Cobra Stone leader to the ball alongside Herman Moose Holmes, another main twenty one leader while Mickey Caldwell was mingling. With high society politicians making the stone look great, Chicago police were back home trying to arrest him for crimes and even went to his house just to find out he wasn't there. And worse yet, when they found out he was invited to the wild, they had a major fit. Law enforcement all over the Chicago area felt betrayed and stone leaders were invited to this event. This event was further solidifying Mickey Caldwell's political connection, which of course would help connection to the whole Black Beast Stone Nation. In January 1965, Ford developed a business and warfare strategy by calling in troops and peaceful meeting with Supreme Gangster Leader Larry Hoover. The gangsters and stones had been at war perhaps since the Supreme Gangster formed in 1964. As of 1968, the gangsters were now engaged in a bloody war with former close allies, the Disciples, and Ford used this opportunity to establish an alliance with Hoover. Larry Hoover's gangsters were built upon making money and hustling in the streets. While the Stones were on a similar page with making money, Larry Hoover accepted this alliance between the two nations and a total ceasefire went in on for about a half a year with some violence here and there. One violent incident involved the Double Six Kings, a Stone group from 69th and Halstead area of Inglewood, thinking the war was still on with the gangsters. This ended up involving Larry Hoover's brother, Charles Hoover, and this was the beginning of the end of the Stone and Gangster relationship. By the summer of 1969, the gangsters allied with the Disciples to create the Black Gangster Disciple Nation. Since 19 the Black Gangster was money making all day. The oldest way the Stone made money was to carry out favor in his for adult small black syndicate groups on the south side. Soon the stone were making money just from imposing tax on the drug dealers, pimps, gambling dens, and other small records. Basically, in wooden on the events of the new territory, you couldn't make money without range of proof and without paying a percent. This was a hustle that worked for many years since the 1960s and the stone also developed a way of making money by visiting local businesses and offering paid protection. There have been many criticisms to this tactic because business owners were left 
with no choice but to pay the stone to protect their property. For the stone would not only leave the being bomb to attack, they would also rob the store since it wasn't on their list. The pain protection was scandalous because it assured that stones would not attack the store, which is basically paying someone to not mess with your own property. Very hard to swap, but one must have to. But one has to view this from another perspective. Woodlawn, Eaglewood, West Eaglewood, South Shore, Bondsville area became very high crime areas in the city, and not only were gangs robbed and steal, but being other criminals who hit these locations, making the stone, making the store owners highly vulnerable to being robbed and vandalized. When the stone offered protection, not only did they stoop, stop their own members from victimizing the bit, they also posted signs on the one of the many visit that this was Black Feet Stone property. And if you dare to attack, there would be dire consequence. Stone placed signs that displayed the pyramid and gave a strong warning that this was Stone property and property of the chief. And these high crime air police patrol were scarcer, scarcer, and just about every store was suffered by vandalism and robbery, which was very costly. Paying the stone was often a better option as the store owners would not have to deal with sudden destruction or robbery in areas more absent of law enforcement. This was the best option mitigating the violence. Example were made in the streets for offenders that touched these stores that were marked by the stone, perhaps a rob or van or beating severe in the street for everyone to witness or bodies will be found later. And this was considered direct, dis direct disrespect to the chief. The stores most collected from from were Jewish owned business that usually charged higher prices for product and dust. Some were taking advantage of the community and the store and the stone was taking some of the extra money back. Stones often left black owned buildings alone because they supported black entrepreneurs, especially since they were very few. Stones were off, always sending different young boys to the store to collect the money. Never would the same stone show up to collect money. Stones also often had members come in from outside the neighborhood so their faces weren't as known as it was a small operation. Alright, let me read this part. What time? Okay. The main reason Eugene Harrison was locked up in prison for nineteen for the nineteen sixty seven murder was because the charges stated he was removing three heroin dealers from the neighborhood. These were non gang related curries that were bringing the dope to the commuter of the room. Off the radar from the rain, Harrison himself always wanted to remove any Italian outfit connected dealers of any sort, therefore, any direct connected to the outfit would prohibit in stone territory. This attitude would always all change when Mickey Carlin explored the possibility of involving the stone in the direct sales of drugs on the street. Carlin had friends that were connected to the Chicago outfit, and Carlin had been working with outfit members for some time in his involvement with the policy numbers racket. Carlin also worked with the outfit. <coughs> Caldwell also worked with the outfit to control several restaurants, nightclubs, and hotels in the black community on the south side and west side. He also was known for providing muscle to extort business and owners to unionize under the outfit control restaurant union. Since government funding had mostly dried up, by 1969, due to the senatorial investigation, Mickey Conway and Rico Cranshaw were the first time to bring the nation to the direct drug trade via Chicago Police Department GIU. Uh, group claims they have photos and surveillance of Stones and Italian Mafia Association meeting to discuss this. Being the first of these meetings was with Joseph Little Season DeBarco, Joseph Big Joe Arnold, and Morris Lasky. I don't know the full extent of the deal, but this was supposed when the stone began to direct of taking a drug trade, mainly in heroin, and prescription, prescription tea and do the motivation for this connection was because stone needed the money as their numbers had exceeded 6,000 members by 1969 and the legitimate forms of money they were receiving prior were either non extent or minimal. The stone were the first gang to engage in a high level drug market 
and this is how Jeff Ford got the reputation of being the king of the hair with being on the south side even though he was not involved in this early deal. This started out a deal for just Crenshaw Stone and Conwell's Cobblestone. Because of this bit of deal for Conwell, this is how the first major heroin distribu distribution business came to Robert Taylor Project, especially in the whole. The cluster of three buildings around 53rd Estate in the Washington Park and this heroin involvement was not big enough, was not big enough to catch the attention of law enforcement, much as mainly Stone was known for selling marijuana, codeine, and other narcotics to peel. Stones also been began robbing other drug dealers in the area and they went to great men by even robbing drug dealer home. Alright, let me scroll down. <clears throat> This part here. There has been a story that has, been, that has floated around that Jeff Ford personally met with Milwaukee outfit leader Frank Bernard Sterry. Ford Ford to officially take over the whole drug gang. From the outfit, the meeting was supposed to reign by youth outreach worker Charles LaPaglia. That was supposedly known to police as low level heroin dealer. Connected to the outfit, making LaPaglia seem to lead a double life. LaPaglia was grilled was grilled to death in the Senate hearing in July 1960, but other than that, it was it seemed like this is the closest the family had a run in with law enforcement. The man was able to continue the youth work well into the 1980s, which doesn't fit the profile of a mafia connected drug curve. It's a poly death in the stuff since the 1960 anyway. Legend has it that LaPaglia a person brought forth before my boss, Frank Bellisteri. Legend has it that Jeff Ford came bearing a gift of a ten thousand dollar fur coat that Frank Bellisteri disrespectfully tossed outside to be used as a doormat and Jeff Ford scurried out of there when the meeting was over. Well I would poke big holes in this story that don't add up. First of all Frank Bellisteri was put in prison for income tax evasion in March 1967 in a federal prison in Sandstone, Minnesota. Frank Minister was then locked up until June 1971. Before March of 1967, Eugene Harrison was still a free man and very much in charge of the reign. He most certainly would never have, would never sanction any heroin business and he would have possibly even tried to kill Jeff over it if, if he was involved. Not only that, Jeff Ford himself was threatening better steering by bringing heroin to Stone Terror. Therefore, no way this meeting happened before March of 1967. The meeting would have had to happen by June 1971, but at that time Jeff Ford was in jail too since April. While he was on trial but again for the same, he found an issue brought up in the senatorial hearings in 1966, so there is no way this meeting could have happened before, 1960, before 1976. By 1976, the stones were already well plugged into the heroin rack and now had become L. Rubens. New Elbridge doctor forbid the sales and use of drugs, especially heroin, that was outlawed until 1985. So after 1976, wasn't likely either. I'm not saying the meeting didn't happen, but what I'm saying is, I highly doubt Jeff Ford was there for it. For it. Jeff Ford also would likely have not tolerated the fur coat being shoved in the mud right there on the spot. He would have likely to walk right out. There's no doubt. Ford eventually sanctioned for participation in the drill march and perhaps Stone did meet with Bella Stare in the night, but it wasn't just that attended because the men were both locked up at the different times and could not meet. 
it appeared the main hookup into the trade was all done in the fall of 1969. Here. As I stated before, the stones were, be, were big into fashions and setting the trends for the neighborhood they lived in. By the late 1960s, they wore the afro of the company with dark red band sunglasses, combat boots, and red beret, and red beret went out on the town. Stones could be seen wearing long fur coats with nice styling hats, pimp canes, platform shoes, and lots of color heading into the 1970s. Now let me scroll down. All right, let me see here. All right, let me let me scroll down to some of this what we want to get to. All right, let me see. Okay, that's the back of the <clears throat> Okay, that's the part there about uh the police officer that was shot. Charles Bay in the main he was one of the main twenty uh police patrolman James Alfano. So I'm gonna scroll on down on that one. Okay, later in the next video from that thing we're trying to see what to murder. charges for the fraud in the federal government. Okay, okay so during these crucial years while both Ford and Harrison were locked up, the stone became began a decline in the disorganization leadership Eugene Harrison and Jeff Ford were both struggling to bring about order over the nation from behind bars, but each of them had their own agenda and this made them rivals in many ways. Both men were locked up in Joliet area, uh, area prison. Fort was in Statesville and Chris Hill and Harrison was in Joliet Correctional. As far as I know, there was no action to their rivalry. While both men were locked up in Joliet area prison, Jeff Fort became fed up with main 21 members acting this law and not obeying laws or paying dues. Therefore, it became time for the chief to set examples. The main 21 members broke the laws and showed this Lord they were executed. This was the only way to maintain order while the chief was locked up. In May of 1974, Jeff Ford felt the need to gain power in a key area on the south side. This coveted area was the intersection of Oakwood and Drexel and the Oakland and they moved. At this intersection, the stone wanted to run out in a drug dinner, obviously in my force, and to even take it as far as running out of all competition. In the nearby public housing project in the Ida B. Wells, Clarence Darrell Homes, and Madden Park Home, but mainly the Ida B. Wells, and the 727 building of the Clarence Darrell Home, located at 727 East 38th Street. This all started with the murder of Gilbert College, who was shot to death in this apartment near 38th and College Road. Bad Stone Hit Squad, consisting of Sammy Knox, and the some Sumner, Harry Evans, and Jackie Clay, the bullet. The bullets were meant for his brother Michael, but this mistaken identity caused me over his life. For God, the world put out that the stone was going to come into run, running. Later in the same Stone Hit Squad, consisting again of Sammy Knox, and the Sumner, Harry Evans, and Jackie Clay, shot up Gregory Freeman as his body was found in the alley by 40 and dressed. Stone then talked two or three witnesses to the murder to not talk to the police and the charge was dropped. Okay, let me see here. Alright, let me see here. It says Stone also pursued their own over the new 
bigger drug trade when examples were made out of two main 21 members, Willie McLilly and Roy Love, and they were both assassinated by another hit squad with one of the same guys consisting of Alan, Alan Knox, Felix Mays, Andrew Craig, and Harry Evans, who shot up the men as they sat in the car. At 8 a third in Ellis in the Chatham neighborhood on November 29, 1974, 1974 as the assassin were allegedly acting on orders from Jeff Ford for mishandling the narcotics trade and being disloyal. Now, in the late part of 1974, Christiana Bay, the National Secretary for the Morris Science Temple of America, paid both Ford and Harrison their visit while they were in prison. Harrison brushed her off and was not interested, but Jeff Ford was all ears. Bay taught Jeff Ford that black Americans descended from Asiatic and Moors to some of these teachers. The descendants of black Americans came from a superior civilization that once ruled a large piece of the world. During slavery day, Moors were exempt from slavery and only Negroes could be slaves. Thus, honoring Moroccan Moors as superior and not classified Negroes in the 18th century, George Washington covered this fact about the Moors up to justify the enslavement of them and soon these tribes forgot their identity and became part of the enslavement and oppression of American society. Teachers also stated that Islam was the natural religion of Africans and that Jesus was not of another color being that Jesus was of another color being killed by the Romans to create Christianity that the legend distorted him into a white man. Teachings also stated that the black man is superior to the white man and the white man has kept the black man at a lower level out of fear of the black man's superior. These teachings were uplifting to Jeff Ford and he continued his visit with Bay even after he was transferred to Leavenworth Federal Prison. The Morris Science Temple of America had started a major recruitment drive and was trying to convert as many blacks as possible and converting Jeff Ford and the whole black piece on there was a major step for them. By 1975, Jeff Ford was fully converted into the nation of Islam and followed the Morris Science Temple of America teaching. While Jeff Ford was converted to Islam, Eugene Harrison faced trouble in Joliet when he was accused of threatening another black piece on the field and inmate who wanted to leave the game. A prison disturbance also went down on April 22, 1975 when a religious group known as Benny Zakim helped inmates carry out a disturbance by bringing drugs to Eugene Harrison so he could use them to control Joliet Correctional as Harrison was now beginning the early stage of trying to take over Joliet Prison. Now that Fort was moved, this action caused a prison riot that resulted in one death. Even though Harrison denied the cause of the riot and threatened another prison, he was transferred out of Joliet to Menard Correctional all the way in, in Southern Illinois. The idea was to get him away, get him far away from Chicago area contact. After his transfer in early 1975, Harrison connected with Herbert Thunder Stevens, who was back in Stateville. After Jeff Ford was transferred, he gave Thunder full control of Stateville. Thunder was also the leader of the Titanic Peace Stones, formerly known as the Four Cornerstone out of Bronzeville, Grand Boulevard. Thunder was on good graces with Eugene Harrison and Jeff Ford, which often didn't happen with Stone Lee. They either chose one or the other. Ford was for sure locked up without parole until March of 1976, while Harrison was up for parole later in 1975. A big decision needed to be made by Stevens to either continue following Ford or go with Harrison, who was more likely to get out and take back over the Stone. Stevens hedged his bet on Harrison and took the Titanic under the wing of Harrison. Now Harrison was running the Black Peace Stone Nation in both prisons, which was a major power move and showed that he was still more than irrelevant. Harrison then sent orders to his men back on the streets to get ready to take it all back and ordered his younger brother, Leroy Lil Bull Harrison, to venture to 43rd Street and connect with the Titanic's and assume immediate leadership. Leroy Harrison gathered men to support this takeover, and several stones found the courage to begin this coup, which was a concern to force follow 
who are still the majority. And this coup was about to arise. Mickey Conway stayed out of it and was willing to just take his cornerstone in an independent direction. Jeff Ford appointed his younger brother, Benny Ford, to run the Fort supporters. Soon the war ensued in 1975 between the younger brothers. And this guy, Lil Bull, thrown in prison for violent crime. The war was a mess. And Eugene Harrison was up for parole in that same year. And this was a threat to Jeff Ford and his support. Jeff Ford then had many phone conversations with Mickey, trying to convince him to run the nation because he would, he would be a better acting chief than Benny. Finally, Mickey agreed to take over the next. Mickey then set out into the streets and took control of the four supporters. And once this happened, and many of Harrison's support got word Caldwell was stepping up, they jumped side to stand by Caldwell because he was so respected. The primary branch still on Bull's side was the Titanics. And Stateville, with momentum, shifted at force. Stone took the power away from Thunder. The Titanic stone then pretty much dissolved in the prison system while Willie Dollar Bill Bibbs took over as chief of the Titanic on the streets. Dollar Bill brought the Titanic under the wing of Jeff Ford's side, which made it look like Bulls attempted to cool with just about fence. Later in the year of 1975, Eugene Hansen was granted parole and he returned to a crew of followers still loyal to him. It would take a lot of rebuilding for Harrison to regrow support and take back over, but Force Guy was still not going to risk it. It was said that Jeff ordered a hit on Harrison, but there was never any evidence of that. But there was indeed an assassination attempt as Harrison was walking along 70th and passing a fruit box from where he was staying. That man jumped out of a car and fired eight bullets, two of which struck Harrison left wrist and one bullet struck him in the back. Harrison fled to a cleaners on 71st nearby and asked for help. He survived. After Harrison's assassination attempt, he realized he could not take over the main book of the stone, therefore he packed up and moved up north to the north side of the city where Randall Stone was living. Up there were out of network from the main branches for the most part. Harrison organized the stones up, up north in areas like Uptown, Rogers Park and the West Town area. These stones became black stones and were now under the Black Peak Stone Nation and the P was dropped. On March 12, 1976, Jeff Ford was released from Leavenworth Prison with a stipulation imposed upon him that he was not allowed to officially reside within the city limits of Chicago. Therefore, he chose to move to Milwaukee because he had a lot of family in that city. Ford's return was anxious in a way that several followers gathered to the city of Milwaukee for hope that their leader would help show them the way to restore the nation they had now become divided. Ford came out of prison with enlightenment and was willing to share all the teeth of the Moorish scientists with all those that would list just through an open house type celebration in a building that served as a temporary headquarters so they could share his new uplifting his spiritual belief. Some of the leaders respect the new way and want to convert to Islam alongside Ford. But many others declined, and they felt they should remain Christian. And this new Muslim religion was foreign and something they wanted no part of. Once again, this nation became trans, trans but this time it wasn't for fashion, it was for religion. Afro was now replaced with Brady Harold Cornrow, and the colorful outfits of the first half of the set were replaced by simple shirts, pants, and sometimes shriners hats worn at worshiping events. L. Rookins still supported black, green, and red colors, the most about and closer to Jeff Ford. To Jeff wore full on and straw hats with their chin strap. At the time of the L. Rookin con converted, Jeff Ford became referred to as Chief Malik. Malik means king in Arabic. Many just referred to him as Chief. And from here on, out in this story, I will be referred to Jeff Ford as Chief because this is the respect of way he is known as and is always considered Chief. To many black banks, peace stone. Even present, he will always be the chief of chiefs and is the most important man in Stone's history. Around April 1970, the Stone were about to advance back onto the south side of Chicago after the chief was in contact with Jane Prince Yak, Brandon, who had just started his own movement called B9 Zekin, which was the Hebrew word for black stones. Prince Yak was a mentor of the chief and helped him solidify the stone during that shaking beginning in Milwaukee. Prince Jack was actually well into his 50 in age, therefore he became a part of Chief's army 
at an early, at an already older age, which was not unheard of and became more prevalent during these days. Prince Yak had opened stone, sons of the ancient Israelite holy temple, or the camp at 42nd and Prairie in the Grand Boulevard neighborhood. At this temple, it was the headquarters of, of the Israelite stones, a branch that embraced the black Hebrew faith because in the Hebrew religion, the black race is God's chosen people. <coughs> Many have said this was just to cover the masculine legal activity. The temple was just one blunt law for the Titanic Peace Stone headquarters at 43rd in Indiana, located exactly at 40, 233 South Indiana. Some of the members of the main 21 were present at this celebration alone with Blackstone leader Eugene Harris. Jeff Ford only wanted his chosen main 21's present that he wanted to convert to this new ways that will soon be announced. One of the main 21 present was the leader of the Titanic, Willie Dollar Bill Bill. The rest of the Titanics were left to Robert Button East. The new order stamped by Jeff Ford was called El Rupins which means cornerstone of the air, a cornerstone of the base, a foundation, and an important piece with holding two walls. Made no reference to a pyramid. It was at this meeting that Jeff Ford officially disbanded the main 21 declared the black piece stone name defunct and was to be replaced by the El Rufin name. Some of those in attendance did not like this new way, and the most vocal was Eugene Harris. Chief then held a private meeting in one of the rooms where Harris and an argument broke out as Chief was trying to convince Harris that this was the best route for the nation and this would bring young black men the proper spiritual guidance that would allow them to stray away from the slave attack. Harris would disagree, mix of religion with gangsterism, and he was stated that he disagreed with wearing turbans in the daytime, then dressing as gangsters at night. He saw this as hypocrite and a disrespect to the religion. Chief became enraged and ordered his death on the spot. But Prince Yak intervened and pleaded with Chief not to kill Harrison even after Harrison taunted Chief. Taunted Chief. Instead of killing Harrison, Chief declared that Harrison was completely out of order for good. Harrison warned that this would be the downfall of everything and Chief responded with a threat to end Harrison if he ever saw him again. Harrison was allowed to walk out of the meeting but was now an even smaller figure in the overall spotlight but he remained chief of the Blackstone, while the Black Peace Stone was supposed to be finished for good as well. Replacing the, replacing the main 21 was a group of generals that chief personally appointed. These original generals were Felix May, Jake Crowder, Alan Knox, Derek Porter, Floyd Davis, Walter Pollard, Edward Williams, Robert Bowman, Bernard Green, Thomas Bates, Eddie Franklin, and others. Chief also appointed a group of enforcers, Harry Evans, Earl Hawkins, Juan Lewis, and the son, son Lewis Hoover, William Doyle, Derek Key, Hank Andrew, George Carter, Ronald Jenner, and others. Wonderful. Let me see. I said one of the first group to drop the stone man with the Moroccan tribe. I am not sure what this group was originally. Called when the L Ruben was first written, but as soon as Jeff Ford brought in the L Ruben name, this group was the first to appear to have dropped the stone name. However, they were unique from other stone and L Ruben. This group may have even dropped the name before the L Ruben Declaration. This group was located mainly in the Lake Park Project at 3939 39 South Lake Park Avenue, in the South all through the rest of Oakland until the Kenwood, Kenwood neighborhood. The 47th Street, they were a part of a well versed group of stone that were also in the Ida B. Well Project, were all early Islamic convert that studied the Holy Quran seven and seven and war blue fences. The Lake Park Project group were the stone that became the Moroccan tribe and kept peace with both El Rufus and Stone. Moroccans had a vicious rivalry with black cancer disciples, but they weren't a gang banging group.
Harrison was still the chief of the Blackstone North Side that said there were no air rulers up there. Stones up that way had some different enemies. They even fought against Hispanic and white gang like the gang lords, maniac Latin, Latin disciples, Simon City Royal, Brazers, Latin Eagles, and some other. I'm not sure when and how the connection came about with the Latin King, but eventually the Latin, the Latin King and the Stone became very close, and it may or may not have begun in the uptown Rogers Park here with Eugene Harris guys or not. Harris's Blackstones had two offshots that broke off and settled in South Shore right in the heart of El Rubin activity. These were the Kingston Raiders and Kingston Killers. The Raiders were from 2nd, 72nd down to 75th and Kingston while the Kingston Killers were from 79th to 83rd in Kingston. The Killers were in South Chicago. The problem is both groups were enemies and they both liked to terrorize Southside House School. Herbert Thunder Stephen was one very close to Eugene Harrison and could ignite the Kingston Raiders, Raiders and Kingston Killers. He was very much looked up to by Harrison. Supporting was perhaps Harrison's top man. The Raiders paid him a tri tribute not only to Harrison and to his side but also to the old ways of the Blackstone Raiders day and it is possible many of their members were original Raiders. There have been legends that once Chief declared the Elk Rubens as a physical replacement for the Stone. He threatened anyone that dared go against the new way would be killed. The old story, if that Mickey Caldwell was the biggest objective to the Elk Rubens order, but as I have, said, have shown, it was Harris who was the biggest objective. It is true that Mickey did not want to convert the Elk Rubens and that's when the uh, Cobra Stone spit away from Chief's honor, but Chief did not sign Mickey's death warrant. It was an option to become an El Rubin, and if you chose not to be embraced by Islam and be considered El Rubin, you were nothing. You weren't a stone. You were nothing. Chief implicitly stated that Black Peace Stone was no longer legit and was officially replaced. This was the new order for, 19, for 1977. Guys like Mickey Conway simply did not buy into this new order and still kept the black peace stones alive regardless of what she said. Mickey also felt more loyalty to Eugene Harrison now that Harrison was out of prison because of the L. Rubin Declaration. The black peace stones were still alive in the further south side neighborhood and the south sub sub suburb stones still were running a good piece of bronze being too much con too, which conflicted with L. Rubin's interest. And later on February 25, 1977, Mick was shot and killed as he was walking home to his Auburn Grisham home at 7820 South City. He was shot right in front of his house. Many suspect that El Rubin for the hit, saying that she wanted him dead because Mick and the Cobra Stone did not become El Rubin, but there was. But there was not only no evidence of this, but Chief didn't have lots of motive at the time because. The way it was in early nights that was, was if you didn't want to be El Rubin, you were just on your own. The violent sanctions didn't begin until later in time. It was also suspected that Caldwell was killed as a result of a mob related hit, which is the more likely scenario, scenario because of one of his closest associates was killed at about the same time. Regardless of what the truth was, the Cobra Stone still left the Black Peace Stone Nation and became known as the Mickey Cobra that year. Let me see here. Let me scroll down.
Now what I'm doing now, I'm scrolling through, and you know, it's basically about some of the, the criminal activities of the uh, of the hell movements. So I'm scrolling through. You know, you can read that on your own, you know. Uh, See, it's showing that uh, things that Chief was saying, but the L. Rubens were involved in a lot of drug trafficking. Okay, and then, uh, well, then let me just read this, this is the part here about the prison riot and uh, how the people and the folks came about. Prisoners were being treated very poorly and often served by food. Despite gang differences, the black gangster disciples, vice lords, black disciples, L. Rookins, black peace stones, black stones, uh, Mickey Cobras, four corn hustlers, and black soul leaders all came together to organize and revolt against prison staff until conditions changed. The best way to make this revolt effective was to in include the Hispanic and white gangs into this. Two since the gangs in general ran the prison. The L. Rukin, Black P. Stone, Black Stone, and Vice Lord sat down with the Lag Kings <coughs> to discuss creating a prison alliance to go about this revolt. The Stone, L. Rukin, and Vice Lord brought in Islamic doctrine to this new alliance known as People. The Lag Kings' role was to bring in the Christian side other lines and recruit Hispanic and white gangs into the people line. However, no white gang became interested in this. The black gangster disciple and black disciples organized the folk alliance and brought in Hispanic and white gangs. On their side, they all became known as folks. Stones and L. Rupert formed a special bond with Latin kings because they both had very similar causes for the creation of their organization. The vice lords and Latin kings could relate on that level too. But they had a dark history of violent warfare in the nineteen sixties and that was not easy to forget. But for Stone, L. Rupert, the Land King, that bad blood wasn't there. The Land King and Stone, L. Rupert Land has remained almost airtight since the nineteen seventies or before these two organizations have rarely had battle between between men despite living in some of the same community on the north north side and in the suburbs. Getting back on track, the People Alliance was born on the same day in the same meeting as the Folk Alliance in April in, in the year 1970. And now, in a beat between L. Rubens and Mickey Cobra was put to an end in the prison system as the Cobras joined people and even adopted some of the Islamic doctrines. The strike was a success as it didn't even make the news or last long once the strike was over. Each alliance went its own way. And sort of became rival groups, but if they never, but if they ever needed, they could come together on issues again. According to the dictionary, folk and people had the same meaning. So these alliances are one and same, but with a different, but with a different word. Now, now this is 
then we come up to the the L we're going to find property to read this. All of this up <clears throat> the year nineteen seven seventy nine would bring the El Rupert into harsh and business and several crime were being carried out by the black peace stone and blackstone and being pinned on the El Rupert's causing police to be in there face also informed the came down hard on L. Rupin enemy that L. Rupin's wanted credit for the show the south side they meant serious business but instead that credit was given to the stones. All this upset the chief therefore he laid out sanctions against the black stone and black peace stone. Now it was no longer a choice to be a stone. It now meant death. Herbert Thunder still won one of the first big losses that he was shot dead in a Harold's chicken parking lot in 75th and exits in the South Shore neighborhood. He was shot dead in the daytime and appeared to be a hit. The circle see the black gangster cycle was a rumor that killed him, but many others blamed Chief and the L. Ruben for the hit, and now bad blood was developed. From Black Peak Stone and Mickey Cole, after Mickey Cole went and heard of Stephen Dell, however, going into the early 1980, the L. Ruben was proved to be perhaps the toughest form to be reckoned with on the south side of Chicago. All right, let me scroll down. In 1983, Chief and William Doyle traveled down to Tupelo, Mississippi in an attempt to engage in a cocaine transaction. The men ended up dealing with an undercover Mississippi Bureau of Narcotics agent. Both men were arrested, which got Chief put in jail. By the summer of 1983, he was released but under the heavy spotlight of law enforcement that was investigating him for drug trafficking. Later, 
then you're the hell movement became connected with Noah Robinson, the half brother of Reverend Jesse Jackson. Through Robinson, Hill movement became connected with Tony Allen Burns, half of Greenville, South Carolina, who was a major cocaine distributor in Boston Bridge, Brooklyn, in and New York City. The hell movement began by Kilo from Burns, Burns Island, in December 1914, was connected, convicted of narcotics trafficking in December 1983 and sent to federal prison. From this point forward, Chief will never see a free day again. It was then said in court document that Chief continued to run the air route from behind bar by talking on the telephone and cold ordering anything from drug movements to murder. One of the order hits in April 1984 was on Jerome Freddie Smith, who was the leader of the Goon Squad gangster that operated in the Ida B. Webb project in Seminole City, 39th Street Footy. Was apparently a friend on El Rupin cocaine operator and the chief passed down the order to take him out. On April 28, 1984, Earl Hawkins, George Carter, and Henry, and Henry Andrew shot and killed Freddie and Tama Hickman in a breezeway in the 706 39th Street building. Said, uh, that uh, by the year 1985, Robert Button East was incarcerated for murder, which left the Titanic Stones in the hands of East, younger brother Ray Scooter East. Robert East had been working heavily with Eugene Harrison to attempt consolidation of all the different Black Peace Stone and Blackstone, Blackstone groups together to go against the Hill Rupert and not adhere to the sanctions. But by the time Robert East was put in prison, he put a major dent in their progress, and Scooter were ruthless and very violent as he led the Titanic to act in the same way causing the organization to go to war with allies like Mickey Cobras and Prairie Avenue and Saint Vice Lord. This not only damaged damage the Titanic also caused Eugene Harrison to act to at last fade completely out of the picture and he became addicted to heroin. Let me see uh okay. In the year 1985, the L. Ruben had lost their main cocaine connection, Blue Burnside, as he was taken to prison. Now the L. Ruben needed a new solid connection to the cocaine pipe pipeline. This is when they connected with one of the biggest drug dealers in Chicago, Willie Morris Fluky Stokes. The L. Rubens had always been against the sale of heroin as it was completely forbidden for sale and use. In 1917, in the year 1985, that would change as L. Rufus and Lance partook in the heroin bit. This all began right at the beginning of the year 1985, January, when L. Rufus connected to Alexander Cooper, a non L. Rufus member that, per that partner that raided with the chief while he was still behind bars. This was when a group was formed called the Gorilla Family. This group was led by Cooper and considered a lower level, less known L. Rufus who would distribute both heroin and cocaine. This group sold in multiple locations in El Rubin territory and built one of the locations was at the Wedgewood, also known as the Pyramid Tower, located in 74 in Woodlawn Avenue in Woodlawn. There was also 71st and Stony Island in South Shore, 47 in Lake Park in Kenwood, 79 Yates in South Shore, 75 in Colfax in South Shore. And even a tavern right across the street from the Ida B. Well project, the guerrillas operation were carefully planned from started at even prime locations picked up the sort the bag, package the dope, and stored it in a proper environment. The gorillas also operated an air-conditioned room, which were ideal for mixing heroin and cocaine in the Harper building, which was located in 76th Fork and Harper, in the Woodland neighborhood. Edward Williams foresaw this operation, and before overseeing the gorilla operate at the Harper, he foresaw operating at the Five Point Terror at 47 in Woodland, in the King Wood neighborhood from 1981 to 1985. In March of 1985, L. Rubin met with King Cobras, an organization that was basically linked to and a part of the Mickey Cobras, 
since at least 1960, Aaron Rupert authorized Treatise Murray and Herman Moose Jack to sell heroin at the intersection of 64, 67, and Blackstone in the Woodlawn neighborhood as long as the sales did not compete or infringe in any way on the heroin sales at the Gorilla Spot in 67 in Stony Island. This remained only last a month before L. Rupert felt the King Cobra had broken their promise and was stepping on L. Rupert, told this is when Chief ordered three of his men to meet on Ralph Theodis Clark. Me and Ralph was cold for shoot but don't kill. This is when the hit squad of Derek Key, Andrew Craig, Edgar Cooksey, and Charles Green to hunt down Clark. They found Clark 67 in Stony Island, shot him in the leg as a warm. Another part of the order was to well done. Herman Jackson treated Murph, which meant go ahead and kill them both. Another order was given to shoot any other King Cobras on site too because of the order to shoot any King Cobra Jackson's brother. Robert Dog Jackson was killed by the hit squad of Andrew Craig, Andrew Ford, and, and David Garnell Rupert attempted to kill Andrew Chalmers and send his squad to make it happen. A squad consisting of Alec Knox, Jeff Ford, James Walker, Roger Hay, Hay Good, and Robert Jones arrived at the Lang Lanagan's Lounge located at 5428 South Houston Street. At 54, the house they in the back of the yard and they were at the body attempt to kill Chalmers, but instead they hit Rico Chalmers, Glenda McClendon, and Vicky Nolan. All three were killed. This was done to insert control or drug operating in the intersection of 54 and Bishop in the back of the yard and they would have the murder authority. Stated in the conspiracy court case of the United States versus Andrew that L. Rupert intimidated women into giving false testimony. By the end of the year, the guerrillas disbanded. And King Cobras and L. Rubens worked out a deal for 67th Street to have Cobras sell in the daytime and L. Rubens sell at night. Alright, this part here is about Momar Gaddafi and Louis Farrakhan and all that. Now let me read this. Uh, in the year 1986, original member of the Black Peace on Charles Edward Bank was accused of killing Fluky Stokes, one of the most notorious and biggest drug dealers in Chicago that the L. Rubens had been working with since 1985. Stokes was making millions of dollars of money in income and infringing on Bank's territory, which was mainly in the South Shore neighborhood. Unidentified men shot Stokes dead on, the no on November 19, 1986. The shooting was said to be ordered by Bay and carried out by L. Rupert, but there was no proof of that. But many will say that it indeed was done by Bay, and his men Bay was shot in an attempt assassination attempt by Fluky Stokes men a couple months earlier. It was said that killing the Stokes was retaliation. Bay was also accused of gunning down the police officer in 97, which was later acquitted of charge. Bay retired from gang life in 1980 and became a community activist until his past in October 2010. More than 700 people attended his room. Now this is about free base of cocaine.
you this. In the year 1988, more bad news came from Eugene Harrison and his supporters. Titanic Peace, the only leader Ray Scooter East was taken into custody as he swallowed him a bunch of bags of drugs to conceal evidence. The bags exploded when police beat him in frustration due to the beating and overdose of the drug. East had a heart attack, had a heart attack and died. Without Scooter, the Titanic began to fall. Then in September 1988, Eugene Harrison himself was shot to death as he stood outside of the Ida B. Wells public housing project after 3 in the, in the morning. He was shot and killed execution style which meant there was a delivery hit on him. Stone supporters of Harrison were infuriated and blamed the L. Rubens for the hit and claim. She gave the order, but L. Rubens even held a press conference proclaiming their innocence in the shooting. There was also no evidence of linking L. Rubens and Harrison killing in the case when never saw the fact that Harrison had become a heroin addict. So there really is no telling who could have shot him. It could have even been someone he owed money to. Without the Titanics and Harrison, the Blackstone were in jeopardy, and this also wasn't good for the Black Peace Stones either. Starting in the mid 1980s, the stone was slow to make the comeback, but it wasn't the Titanic stone leading John the Stone Branch to begin restoring order was the legendary Maniac P Stone, formerly known as Maniac Ranger. The Maniac P Stone, younger generation 98, was, was groomed by high ranking L. Rupert. They were family connected to the young stone, therefore, Maniacs were completely exempt of sanctions. They could use the stone name as the 1980s progressed, the stone grew more, and Maniacs pushed. The P back into Black P Stone. Even some L. Rupin began to flip the stone root, sometimes to avoid prosecution. Now that L. Rupin were labeled as terrorists, these young, younger brothers of older maniacs came from the Pocket Town area, which is the far eastern part of Greater Grand Cross neighborhood and borders the South Sword neighborhood. Therefore, these stones were very close to the main government strongholds of the L. Rupin. L. Rupin took young maniacs into the peace and love, being a symbol for place in Kingston and taught them most of everything they knew. Makes the raid young man at peace on when had to conduct up being this and how many had developed so many killers and leaders among their ranks and since they were the only branch sanctioned beast on they were selected with ally one of their tightest allies was the Mickey Cole. El Rubin even allowed man to run near nearby Center Fourth and Phillips in South Shore all the way down to 83rd Street in the South Chicago neighborhood in the later night as the El Rubin was being drilled with prosecution, the man has stood up to end it. They are ruling sanctions against the stone. When we seem to put an end to that, this caused more stone factions to begin gaining steam again. Man has not a hustling type of group. Instead, they were kind of military, like just like the L. Rupert. They did business, but they mainly focused on maintaining order, just like the L. Rupert. Maniac peace stones were between both worlds, between stone and L. Rupert. Another pivotal event happened in the year 1991 form. Four corner stone finally leader Randy Rube Dillard seed control of the Black Peace Stone that, that year. The Titanic Peace Stone official went to front that year and were no longer the top Black Peace Stone branch official. Obviously, Rube was locked up in Menard Penitentiary at the time and created the Rubenite Stone around this time that the Rubes were created. In 1990, Randy Dillard was let off death row and down got the Rubes hitting the ground, running in the northern Inglewood area near Garfield Boulevard on the Inglewood back of the yard board the area ran by stone since at least 1955. Rube was especially known for stabbing serial killer John Wayne Grace in prison. The Titanic Peace Stone would not return until 2003. Then we have 
had this uh, at the time, 1980, and heard the Stones, a chief were attempted to take over the Hell Rivers and the Stones. Antonio, Prince of King Fort, the oldest son of Jeff Fort, was in the early, was in his earlier to be at the time attempted to seize power over the Hell Rivers. However, many Hell Rivers weren't happening because of Antonio Fort's drug problem. He even chief himself to prove his son one of the Hell Rivers, and he would pass down violation to Antonio by having him be the more influential son of Prince Waikita, the Venezuela fourth, who was only in his early 20s and in the early night when he came into life. Waikita was four years younger than Antonio, but seen as more of his father's charisma. Waikita was identified more with the stone as opposed to the hero who would be a major ally for the stone. Then he talks about the jet blacks. Then in conclusion, so as you can see, that's the black peace stone. And the reason why I didn't finish because of, I mean, you know, basically the information is uh, once you get to that part. Uh, Chief was in prison, and a lot of it just street stuff. And, uh, and so, but that's the history of Chicago. So, now let me uh, let me go over here to Instagram for a minute here. I ain't gonna be that long. Hello everybody, my name is Eric D. Johnson, also known by Shandy Ryan, in the city of Minnesota County, in the state of Tennessee, the game day is early Saturday morning, November 3rd, 2019, time 7 o'clock a.m. First thing I thank all my family support for your continued current support. Anti-gang. And you go to the main anti gang logo. Now, uh, I only be long, uh, be about a minute. 
but uh, I was recording on my YouTube channel, The History of Chicago, and we was talking about the Black Peace Stone Nation, so it took me a little, took me a time, took a little time, and so I'm not gonna be long on my Instagram video today, but I will be coming back on my next video and pick right back up where I left off. So I'm gonna be ready to end my Instagram video. I just want to let my Instagram viewers know that I was recording on my YouTube channel and it took a little time, you know. So until my next Instagram video, take care of yourself. Wish each and every one of your very best. And watch my YouTube channel. Now I'm uh, doing my uh, periscope. Hello everybody, my name is Eric D. Johnson, also known by Shirley, right here in the city of Memphis, in the county of Shirley, State of Tennessee, the day in danger, the morning, uh, November 3rd, 2019, time 706 a.m. First, I thank all my family support for your team care and support. Anti-gang. Now these are just a few of the free logo design website you can go to the main anti-gang logo.
also remember the word coerced, coerced, sexual coerced, psychological coerced, psychological manipulation, psychological abuse. Thank you.